Thank <laughs> you.
Welcome to the Satori celebration. Blessed are you, holy mindfulness. In you we live and move and have our very being. You are mother, father, teacher, and friend. You draw us forth, luring us into that wholeness which is nirvana. We give thanks to you for Shakyamuni, the Buddha, who shows us the way through his life, his journey into darkness, and his awakening. And behold, the night had fallen, and the lonely one, vowing to achieve liberation before all the worlds, made his seat beneath the Bodhi tree, sinking into the utter stillness in silent lucidity, the mind of Siddhartha was tormented by Mara, the evil reflection. Three times it did pass, as the cloud of delusion, the chain of greed, and the stench of hatred. And lo, did the homeless one gently let go, embraced by the ground within him. And all the earth cried, I bear witness to thee. And then did spring forth the way of the Bodhisattva, the wisdom of clarity, the fullness of life, the freedom of giving. <clears throat> And then as the dawn broke, the morning star arose within him, and it was at once accomplished. Thus the awake one proclaims, I was, am, and will be enlightened simultaneously with the whole universe. All that has come to be is alive with the infinite light and life. And this light comes forth from the source of being enlightening everyone born into the myriad worlds. And this light so shines in the dark, and the darkness shall not prevail against it. Great Spirit, say. Tonight's talk is very brief, and the name of it is The Call of the Buddha. So tonight we celebrate the Feast of Enlightenment. In fact, we've been celebrating it since December 8th. And while we lift up the life of Shakyamuni the Buddha as our archetype or as our model for our practice, what we're really celebrating tonight is something that we believe. Now, Buddhism in general is not really about your beliefs. 
It's more about your practice and what you do. And while this is true, there is still one basic belief that we hold, and that is the possibility that we can awaken, that we can wake up. And if we don't have faith in that ability, then there's no real reason to practice. So having faith in the possibility that we can wake up is probably our, our foundation. And the story of Shakyamuni, told in a mythological framework, is there not so much for us to emulate his exact experience in the way that he did it, but to experience it for ourselves in our own life. But we must come to this believing that it is possible. And certainly, in the beginning of our practice, we may not feel that way. And as we practice and we go through the various ways of mindful living, and we begin to gain confidence because of the freedom that we experience. We find that it becomes easier and easier to realize that that is possible. So what is the call of the Buddha? Well, we always set our idea of how things are presented within the cosmic framework. So we start with a very old and cosmic perspective. So we go back to the very beginning, as far as we know, of our universe, 14 some billion years ago. And we move forward in time to the time of the development of our galaxy and our solar system and our planet. And then after some billions of years, you end up with living creatures that evolve into all kinds of diverse species and manner. And finally, you have mammals. And then you have the beginnings of what we might call humans. Now, in the beginning, humans were like the animals. As the aboriginals say, during the dream time, we were just like the animals. We knew no difference. We had no self-awareness. And whatever we did have was very limited. And so there was consciousness, but there was no real self-awareness. And then, as we evolved into beings with bigger brains, we developed a greater and greater sense of self-awareness. And as this self-conscious blossomed, it gave us two things. First, it gave us the birth of anxiety. It gave us the birth of depression. Because we were the first creatures, as Carl Jung once said, who stood above the plane and looked out. And I always like to think of that, that early hominid human or early homo sapien, who, and I'm sure it wasn't like this, it's probably a slow of all, but I always think of this one who gets out of the cave one day and she looks out and she goes, damn. <laughs> it's just this realization that I'm going to die and it's really dangerous out there and so from there is born all the existential anxiety that our human race has been scarred by for millennia but at the same time that self-consciousness allowed us to reflect it allowed us to contemplate in the beginning, we experienced this anxiety that came from this great sense of separation, that I'm no longer unconsciously one with nature. Now I am separate. Now I have this awareness. And you see this story illustrated in all the great myths of humanity. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's the Garden of Eden. But we realize that we're no longer one. And so then humans began to try to find a way to experience that oneness again. And we did that by seeing animation in, in the trees, in the animals that were around us, and even the mountains, and even in the lightning, and finally even in the fire. And then some 3,000 years ago, something that even scholars admit was, was new, was different person that we celebrate tonight, much of his life legend and lore, but someone that scholars believe actually did exist, 
he became the pioneer of our tradition. And his awakening, which we hold up in, in great mystical language, was an awakening to a sense of oneness with all of life. The great Zen teacher, Shota Harada, said, the Buddha looked up at the morning star, the planet Venus, and said, look, that's me that's shining so bright. And so there was a sense of belonging, the sense of connectedness. And that realization helped him to overcome that existential loneliness. And it helped to remove the anxiety and depression that he felt. And then after he had his experience, he, he wanted to try to figure out a way to share that with others because he knew he couldn't just give you something to believe in. He had to give you practices so that you could go out and do it for yourself. Because in the end, it doesn't matter what I say or anyone else. It matters what you experience for yourself. And so the call of the Buddha is for you to have the exact same experience as Shakti. And that is available to us. That's not something special. It just belongs to an elite group. It belongs to everyone. And in my experience, nirvana is not experienced in one big moment. I mean, we might have those, right? It's like our ancestors when lightning first struck the savannah and caught it on fire. And they learned to sort of cook and put their food and meat near that fire. And then they learned to curate that flame. And that's what changed us. That's what gave us these big brains. Well, I think of it the same way. That, that, that bolt of lightning, that awakening experience might happen. But if we don't do anything with it, if we don't take that flame home and cultivate it, and keep that flame, then it will go out. And all we'll be left with is the embers of an experience. So our way is not about just having these big peak experiences. Our way is the ordinary life of daily practice, experiencing nirvana on a daily basis by taking our minds through that process of challenging the thoughts and beliefs that create so much suffering. In the ancient text, the Dhammapada, the very first line of the very first chapter attributed to the Buddha, his words are very simple. It is with our thoughts that we are made up. It is with our thoughts that we experience the world. And so that's the secret of mindfulness. We must realize that we can change our thoughts. And we can challenge our thoughts that create suffering with reality. And even when reality is unpleasant, at least it's clear. And it gives us a way through. And finally, that calling beyond just the experience of our own awakening was the call of what we call the Bodhisattva. And that was a vow to realize that my awakening, my individual experience of awakening, is not separate from yours. And I never have to look at it as either me being awakened or you being awakened. Because in some sense, because of our interdependence, our interconnectedness, our awakening is all one. And that was the great mysterious thing that supposedly Shakyamuni said under that Bodhi tree. Behold, we're all enlightened at once. And so I like to think over the vast great expanses of time and space and endless dimensions and alternate universes that that is true. And in some small and humble way, here in this little temple, we are holding and lifting that up so that each generation will know the Dharma. Each generation will keep these practices so that each generation, in their own way, in their own process, can experience the joy of liberation. So that's the call of the Buddha that I offer that to you. Tonight we will do a candlelight offering. Because we are a Western tradition, which means we're an American tradition, we have integrated different things from different cultures. Our roots are in the Japanese culture of the Zen and Shin Buddhist tradition. 
and some from the Kagyu Tibetan tradition. But we've also integrated things like, you can see over there, there's a, a beautiful pine tree. His name is Sir Frederick. And the pine tree for Chinese and Japanese and Korean Buddhists for thousands of years has represented the idea of the eternal true Buddha nature. Even on the back of the cases that some of our ordination uh, folks wear, there's a little pine branch sewn into the top. So this is a symbol that belonged to them, but it also belongs to us coming via route to Germany and to the embrace of, of this culture. So we honor that, we integrate it. Tonight we do a candlelight offering. So usually people offer incense. But tonight we, we offer you to come up to the altar and bow. And we'll receive a candle. You'll light your candle from the main altar, bow, and then turn and bow it down. And then you turn to your seat. And then we will also chant the Nimbutsu. And we will do that to the tune of Still Not. So it will be familiar to you. So before we begin that, I'm going to sing chant the Atadipa, the returning to the light. Ata Deepa Viharata Ata Sarana Amana Sarana Traditionally, this is a candlelight service, but with our, our, our live streaming light, that might be a little brighter. But if you don't mind, I turn that light off over there. That'll give us a little semblance of the mood. You can probably actually get another one. We can? Yeah. Oh. 
beings without exception, may all attain complete wisdom and awaken to the reality in the realm of serenity and joy. Let us go forth in love and peace, a light unto the world.
Friends are tourist service. Sorry about my voice a little bit. The incense got me a little bit. <laughs> when I went to get for the higher notes, it was like, uh-oh, that's not happening. <laughs> so I apologize for that. But thank you for being with us. Um, when we are done, uh, you can come up and you can just put your candle in the uh, sand of this offering bowl. Just be very careful because this uh, special incense burner can get very hot. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Happy Satori.